This is a dominant presentation. Okay, so um, for the talk of this evening, uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about thought. And the first thing that I ever learnt about thought was from my father. And he said, because, because whenever I do something wrong or break something or make some mistake, then I'd say, but I thought. <laughs> I, th I, th I, thought that was, I thought it was like that. I thought you were supposed to stick your finger into the PowerPoint. <laughs> And he'd say, you know what thought did? Thought wet his bed and thought his brother did it. So that was my first lesson in thought. Right? It's very important. Yeah? Because that's the, that's the basic lesson of Buddhism, is that what you think it's not necessarily the case, not necessarily the reality. And as these things go, sometimes you learn these things and it's kind of a joke or whatever, but then more and more you kind of go on in life, you more realize that there's actually something quite profoundly true about that. And I probably didn't really un understand <coughs> that kind of idea until I'd done my first meditation retreat. And I still remember this coming out of that retreat. And I went back to this guest house that I was staying in and just sitting in the guest house in the evening and, you know, just people sort of gather, maybe they're going out that night or something like that and gathering around in the evening before going out, maybe having a cup of coffee or whatever and chatting. And I remember just sitting around with a group of people and just thinking, everyone believes their thoughts. <coughs> everyone has a thought and then suddenly it's them. Everyone... Everyone's so attached to what it is that they're thinking about. And that's what I'd learned on this, one of the things I'd learned on this retreat was to be able to just to step back a little bit and to realize that you're not your thoughts. And that's something which is very, very powerful. One of the first things that happens when we sit to meditate, and you, this is such a common experience, people sit down, they want to meditate, they want to be peaceful, and they hear all of the Buddhist advertising, oh yes, you'll be peaceful and happy and <laughs> let go, <coughs> so lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and you sit down to meditate and actually, oh my, it's like this kind of fiery rage of kind of anxieties and tensions and energies and you, you, you never realized how much dukkha there is inside this, 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 this body. Everything becomes more intense and you're trying to meditate and you're trying to say, oh, I'm going to watch my breath, I'm going to do this, I'm going to, God, I can't stand this anymore. <laughs> But I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit. I'm going to sit for. I'm going to sit for a half an hour. I'm going to sit for an hour. Okay, at least I'll sit for half an hour. <laughs> I'll keep going. No, mate, at least twenty minutes. How long is that? Oh, that's two <laughs> two minutes. Okay. Okay. Now. I... <laughs> and the first thing everybody says in the meditate is, "Oh, I had so many distracting thoughts." as if your thoughts are a problem. But remember what I just said a minute ago, we always, we always identify with our thoughts. Okay, we always, we, 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 don't even, we don't even reflect about it, it's just automatic. That's it's something that we, that's in our mind that we think, it's, it becomes who we are. 
Imagine what it would be like if you were to think somebody else's thoughts. Right? It's not easy to imagine, is it? We don't know what somebody else's thoughts are like, right? So what would happen if suddenly your thoughts were swapped with the thoughts of somebody else? Would you still be you? Would that be like you here sitting thinking somebody else's thoughts? Or that would, would that be actually you? Would you go with your thoughts? Right? But let's say everything else stayed the same. So maybe your emotions stayed the same, but your thoughts changed. Is that possible? I don't think it's even possible, is it? These things are so interconnected. Yeah? So if, if it's really the case that we are so closely identified, so intimately believe in our thoughts, we think we are our thoughts, then if we're going to come and sit and meditate and and we see our thoughts as a problem, then we've got an issue there. Because our thoughts are who we are. So we're a problem. Right? When you come and sit and meditate, immediately, I'm a problem. That's what it's become. I'm my thoughts, and so I'm a problem. I don't want my thoughts to be there. I don't want me to be there. How can I get rid of me? I'm dukkha. <laughs> if only I could wipe all of these things out, put them somewhere else. But not completely, because I want to get them back a bit later. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I just put them in a drawer for a little while and let them just. just and then afterwards, take them back and put them back in. Maybe we'll be able to do that in the future, I don't know. Maybe you'll be able to just sort of download your thoughts before you meditate, right? <laughs> yeah, you can sort of make a backup of your thoughts and then just wipe your mind clean and then go and meditate. Ah, oh, that's very peaceful. <laughs> and then when you finish, you can just put them back again. That'd be handy, wouldn't it? Yeah. So you can see if... this. You can see this thing that if we make a if we make our thoughts into a problem, then we we're like we're like stepping out on the wrong foot. We're we're starting out the wrong way in a meditation. So thoughts aren't a problem. Now, if we have a look at when Buddha taught the eightfold path, yeah, right view is the first one. The second stage of the Eightfold Path is right thought. Yeah. Samasankapa means like right motivation, right intention, right thought, something like that. So we should see how the, what, what, how the Buddha uh, approached this, how he, he uh, developed this idea in his own practice. Because one of the things that's very interesting about the, the Buddhist scriptures is that they don't just present you um, uh, a sort of a final, uh, a final sort of doctrine or something like that. But it also the, the Buddha also teaches about how it is that he discovered these things, how, how he found out about these things. It wasn't. It's not obvious. And it took somebody with the with the brilliance and the the, the insight and the genius that the Buddha had to really be able to look at these things and understand them as they are. So one of the uh, uh, discourses where he talks about this is called the Dweda Vitaka Sutta, the, the two kinds of thinking. And so this was, this is the, the Buddha was talking about the period of time that he was practicing before he became enlightened. And he said that uh, in that time of practicing he um, uh, he was alone in the forest meditating and sometimes he'd, his mind would think about unwholesome thoughts, thoughts of greed, hatred and delusion. Or actually it's framed in terms of the, the thoughts of the uh, right, wrong, uh, the, the, the uh, micha sankapa, the wrong, wrong, wrong thought of the Eightfold Path. So it's thoughts of uh, ill will, thoughts of harming, 
uh, and thoughts of uh, attachment, holding on. So he'd have these things and then he'd notice that when he had those things he would suffer. And he realised that those kinds of thoughts lead to suffering, they lead to affliction, they lead to affliction for himself, they lead to affliction for others, and they don't actually do any good for anybody. But then there are other thoughts that he had, thoughts of kindness, thoughts of compassion, thoughts of letting go. And when he had those kinds of thoughts, then that didn't lead to any affliction, didn't lead to any suffering for himself, didn't lead to any suffering for others. So he said, okay, well, why don't I abandon those kinds of thoughts that lead to suffering and just think those thoughts that lead to happiness. So this is what they call in modern psychology, they call CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Yeah? That's one part of the Eightfold Path. Now, so you can see that that, that that process of development is based on like an inquiry. It's not based on a sense of aversion. And it's very, very important to notice. It's not like the Buddha sat down and said, I'm going to try to meditate. Oh, I can't meditate because these thoughts are annoying me. How do I get rid of them? Right? Yeah? It's based on understanding. What actually happens when I think like this? What actually happens when I think like that? Investigate and inquire. I understand. Oh, okay. Yeah? So it's not about thinking, I, I want to be at some end kind of state and, and I'm going to make myself get from here to there. It comes from understanding where you are right now. This is very, very important. So where you are right now, of course, is the present. Yeah. Often we use the phrase in Buddhism, the present moment. Ajahn Brahm wrote his book, Pre Present Moment, something, something, present moment. I don't believe in the present moment. I think the present moment's a myth. <laughs> the Buddha never talked about the present moment. Yeah? The phrase doesn't occur in any of the Buddha's t teachings. He talked about the present. And the present's much better, isn't it? Because the present is what you get on Christmas. Yes. <laughs> it's what you get on your birthdays. You get your present. Ah, you're so happy. Oh, I've got all these presents. Yeah? So then if you get the present, it's just like Christmas every day. When you come down to meditate, ah, oh, it's so wonderful. It's present. Yeah? Well, it's the same word, it's the same meaning. You know? The present is something that's presented to you. Yeah? That's why they call it it's a present, it's a gift. And the present, that's what it is. It's something that's presented to us. It's a gift that we have. Every moment is like a gift. It's, you just think of that moment. Yeah? I mean, we're probably all kind of too old and jaded and cynical now to really enjoy Christmas anymore. But you remember those times when you were kids and... And you know, oh, what's going to be under the Christmas tree? And you sort of sneak out at night to have a peek and try to figure out what that is. <coughs> and that moment when you kind of open it and you discover, it, wow, it's so exciting. Yeah? But actually, if you, if you are really present, actually every moment is like that. Because every moment is something new. Every moment is something unexpected. So this is the, the present. So when we talk about the present moment, even though I, I, I was just doing it just then by mistake, I hope you notice that. The present moment is too tight. Yeah? The present moment is like walking on a tightrope. And if you think, oh, I have to be in the present moment, then you're always going to be worried that you're going to fall off it. Yeah? The present is like riding on a camel. kind of a bit broader, a bit more solid, you can kind of squiggle around a bit, maybe like riding on an elephant for Sinsin. Yeah, so the presence, it's like riding on an elephant. The Sinsin probably wouldn't ride on an elephant because it's, uh, it's, too, uh, it's, it's too cruel for the elephant. But imagine that the elephant really wanted to be ridden on. <laughs> what if the present refuse, groan spits and refuses to stand up? 
yeah, then that's no good. You know. This is a nice camel. So that's that's the that's what they, think of the, the present like that. It's very comfortable. It's something which is a gift. The world wants to give you this gift every moment. That gift, that gift of awareness, of knowledge, of understanding, of clarity. So when you think about it like that, the, the, the present isn't something you have to. It's not something you have to hunt down. Not something you have to sort of um, uh, sort of pin down and, and 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 see like through a microscope or something like that. It's not something that's very hard. It's just something that's very expansive. It's just everything that is. That's all. So being present is actually the easy thing. Now this this question of being present, how do we be present, is very closely related to that 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 understanding of thought. And notice how this works in your meditation, that, that when, when our mind thinks, we tend to, to go out of the present. Right? Now this is one, one of the, this is one of the reasons why in, in meditation, it's always good, the, the foundation of any kind of meditation is, is mindfulness of the body. Because when you, when you, the, the, the five physical senses are always in the present. It's only the mind that goes into the past and the future. Right? So whenever you touch something, you're always touching something in the present. Whenever you hear something, whenever you see, whenever you smell, whenever you taste, it's always in the present. So all, all good meditation should start out with some awareness of the body, whether that be walking meditation, be aware of your postures, or um, uh, uh, watching your breath, yeah, some kind of something like that, where you where you ground yourself in the present by being aware of the physical sensations, and those physical sensations will always bring you into the present. But our mind is not just made up of physical things; our mind is also made up of concepts. That's what they call in in um, in Buddhism nama rupa. Is you have this idea of uh, a rupa means a, a form or appearance, and nama is a name or a concept. So uh, uh, the world that we live in is a world where uh, things have particular forms, and we have concepts in our mind that correspond to those forms. That's a very simple way of putting it, but that's good enough for what we need need to understand now. So you have like a uh, you, you see. Uh, a poster, and you have a, a word in your mind, poster. You, you see uh, an air conditioner, and you have the word in your mind, air conditioner. You see or touch uh, you know, a glass or something, and then you have that form, which is a physical thing, physical reality in the present, and then you have a concept or a name for that. And the world we live in is the world which is made, made up of those things. And it's very important to understand that, that that ability to name things and to understand things through concepts is what enables us to make sense of the world. Names and concepts are not a problem. Using those names and concepts, we string them together, organize them, rationalize them, articulate them, and make, make sense of them using grammar. Okay, So grammar is how we put all of those different names and relate them to each other. And when we use grammar, we, ha we involve time, don't we? It's one of the things the Buddha pointed out. It's a very subtle point that the Buddha, Buddha made. Whenever, you get, whenever you're using language, then you, you're, you're invested in the three periods of time, the past, the present, and the future. Right? Because words have tenses. I will be. I was. Will I be? What happened? What is? Yeah? Whenever we're using language, we're involved somehow in time. I don't know what would have happened if the Buddha was Chinese. Or Thai. <laughs> because tenses are kind of optional in some languages. 
But uh, anyway, he wasn't. He was Indian. So whenever you, whenever you say a phrase in Pali or Indic languages, you always have to have the tenses there. So you get... You're, you're, it's, it's very important to understand this point. It's because we're getting invested in that, the past and the future through the use of language. You know, this is why we're being brought out of that present. And this is how we make sense of the world. We need to do that. And it's actually an incredibly wonderful and powerful facility. This, power, this ability of the human mind to be able to do that, to be able to project itself into the past, to be able to project itself into the future, to be able to go into the there and the then, to be able to analyse things, to use logic. All of those things are very uh, sophisticated and very powerful and very helpful things we all need to do. So we should be proud of the fact that we can do those things. Right? So don't be sitting there in meditation thinking, oh, my, my, my thought is a problem. Actually, your thought is a gift. Your thought is, a, is, a, is, a, is an incredibly useful and wonderful thing to be able to do. But there are even more wonderful things that you can also do. So the problem is not the thought, but the problem is because we get attached to it, we identify with it, and then we get trapped within that. We don't just use it for what it's useful for, but we also get trapped in it when it's not useful anymore. So Buddhas still think, one of the suttas, the Majjhima Nikaya, it says that the Buddha uh, or an enlightened person thinks the thoughts they want to think and doesn't think the thoughts they don't want to think. Right? <laughs> so it's not that they, if, if there was something wrong with thought, then they just wouldn't think at all, right? But sometimes they think about things, but only when it's useful. And then they stop. Yeah? It's easy, isn't it? You just think about what you need to, and then when you finish thinking about it, oh, okay, I've worked that out, I understand that now, now I can stop. <laughs> That's not quite how it works, is it? Yeah? You keep on going even long after. Yeah? It's, it's exhausted its usefulness. You go around even when it's actively harmful then we still keep on going. Yeah? And then somehow we blame the thought for that. It's not the thought's problem. The thought's fine. But it's our own attachment to it. It's our identification with it. It's because we can't let go of it. That's the problem. So when we... If we try to make ourselves not think then we're just going to have more aversion. We're going to be in a, in a space that, uh, where we, we, we don't like who we are, we don't like what we're doing, we don't like our mind, and we're going to try to get rid of it. And that's going to be very annoying and probably not very successful. So instead of that, bear in mind what the Buddha said with those the two kinds of thought, the wholesome thought and unwholesome thought. If you do... We all have those kinds of thoughts within us, right? They're not, they're not something which is alien. It's not something that only Buddhas have. They're very simple. Sometimes we think kind thoughts. Sometimes we think harmful thoughts. So, we have at least some measure of control over that. Not complete control, right? You can't just make yourself think anything or stop thinking something. But some control we have. And so we can intervene and direct our thoughts in a wholesome way. One of my favorite uh, stories about that was the story of the, the going forth of the monk, uh, Upagupta. And he was a shopkeeper and every day one, there was a, a monk would come for alms round to his shop and he would give him some alms and then he, he the monk was called Shanakawasin and then he wanted to, uh, Upagupta wanted to go forth and uh, Shanakawasin said, no, no, you're not, you're not ready. Then he said, well, how do, what do I do, how do I train myself? I, can't, I don't have time to meditate, I'm working here every day in my shop. 
And he said, okay, we'll get two piles of stones. One pile of black stones, one pile of white stones. And you keep them on the counter of your shop during the day. And whenever you think a thought of greed or hatred or delusion, then you take a black stone and you put it in the pile. And whenever you think a thought of kindness or letting go, and you take a white stone and you put it in the pile. Yeah, that's perfect. Hmm. We can do it, yeah, exactly. No, it's not too hard. And the interesting thing is that he didn't say to him, don't think the black thoughts. He didn't say these ones are bad and those ones are good or anything like that. Just, just keep it. And, and it's not only, it's a very skillful means for many reasons, but one reason was because, of course, he was a shopkeeper, right? So he's used to accounting things, right? So he gives him a method of doing accounting for his thoughts. You know, this is, how, 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 uh, this is a mark of a really kind of clever teacher. So he's there, and at the end of the first day, there's a big pile of black pebbles, right? <laughs> and he keeps on doing that, and gradually there's more and more white pebbles, and at the end of every, every time, at the end of every day, there's more white pebbles and less black pebbles, until eventually there's only a pile of white pebbles at the end of the day. And then the monk said, okay, now you're ready to go forth. Yeah? So he's in, he, he ordained him as a monk. So if we, if we understand like that, and if we use, use that way of, of training, then you can see that, that this, is, this is much more kind of gradual. That we don't just go from, you know, ordinary life, all the things that we've been doing, and then just sit in, sit in meditation and expect to make our mind peaceful straight away. You know, this is what I did, certainly in my, my first retreat, when I had no notion of anything. In, you know, Buddhism or training the mind or anything like that. I just sort of walked in off the street and, and sat and did an intensive meditation retreat. So there was a lot of suffering there. Yeah? And it was not necessary to go through all that. That's the way I did it. But that's just because I'm stupid. You should be smarter than that. Imagine what it would be like if you actually did that. Imagine what it would be like if you trained yourself so that all that there was in the mind was thoughts of kindness, compassion, letting go. Yeah? And then you sat down to meditate. Yeah? Would, you be, would, would you see your thoughts as a problem? No, oh, it actually is quite nice. Yeah? Just thinking kind thoughts. It's not, it's not stressful, it doesn't produce any anxiety, it doesn't produce any tension in, the, in your body or anything like that. So you'd be quite happy. And so this is in the Dvaita Vitaka Sutta, the Buddha was saying that, that, he, that he practiced like this and then he realized he can just keep on thinking like this all day and all night. And it would never cause him any disturbance in, 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 in his mind, never cause any suffering, never cause any harm for himself or others. And so he can just keep on thinking like that. It's not a problem. But he also realized that it's, it, as long as he kept on thinking like that, that he wouldn't be able to bring his mind to stillness, to a deep sense, sense of stillness. That's what we call samadhi. And so for that, he then had to learn that another skill, the skill of going beyond thoughts. So it's very important to notice this this progressive aspect in the teachings. And so often we try to ignore this and we try to jump over all the earlier stages and we get to the final stage and sort of bash away at the final stage. We're gonna we're gonna you know the final stage of the Eightfold Path is right samadhi. Right? So we think, oh we're gonna go on to retreat and then sort of bash our head against a meditation object for, for a month or six months or something and we've ignored all of the other parts of the Eightfold Path and then we wonder why it's so difficult and we say, we say to the meditation teacher oh meditation is so hard <laughs> meditation is not hard meditation is easy meditation is just a cause and effect right samadhi is just what happens when all of the other factors of the Eightfold Path are there it's no harder 
than, than, than it is for a, for a flower to grow from a seed. Just a flower saying, oh, it's so hard to grow. <laughs> oh, it's such a hassle having to be blue, you know, or yellow. I have, you know, every time someone looks at me, I have to be yellow for them. You know, oh, it's such a hassle. And round. You know, it's just cause and effect. If the seed's there and the ground's there and the, the water's there and all the conditions are there, it's just what happens naturally. So if the, if the conditions are there for the Eightfold Path, then it's just natural. Your mind becomes peaceful. It's not hard work. If it's hard work, you're doing something wrong. So if you're trying to meditate and the meditation's not going well, it's not much point in, in, in trying to, you know, I think I've got to meditate more. A lot of people go around and try to find the, the right meditation teacher. I'm going to find this method or that method or I'll go to this monastery and that monastery and this is like the new fad, so I'll go and do that. And this one, oh, they've, they've got lots of, they've got, this person's really famous or that monk's got a really... Everyone says he's enlightened or something like that, so I'm going to go and learn. Oh, well, it's just a waste of time. Meditation, you just sit and meditate. Very simple. But if it's not working properly, then it's because all of the, the causes are not ready. So rather than being frustrated, go back and look at those causes. Each step of the Eightfold Path. Prepare each step as carefully and thoroughly as you can. Right view. Yeah? Read the suttas. Study the Buddha's words. Listen to Dhamma talks. Question. Discuss. Clarify. Yeah? Right thought. Make sure that your, your, the, the, your motivation, where you're coming from, make sure that's wholesome all the time. That's probably the most single most important one. And also all the, all the, all the precepts. So you keep coming back and looking at the causes. So right samadhi, or being able to come to a place in the mind where the thought disappears, is on the is on the, the far side of pure thoughts. It's what happens when you have your mind is full of only wholesome and pure and good thoughts and is even able to let them go. Now, you can experience that to a little degree anytime. Now, actually, we, we, we always have breaks in between our thoughts. It's just like if you're uh, uh, reading a book, there's always breaks in between the words, breaks in between the sentences. And the same thing in your mind. There's always gaps in between the thought, but we don't pay attention to them. So if you pay attention to the gaps, the spaces that are already there, there's already a little bit of them there. And the more we meditate, the more we practice, the more those gaps will become, uh, the, the, the stillnesses will become more profound. And it's not a matter of making yourself be still. It's not a matter of stopping the mind from thinking. But you just don't need to. You don't identify with the thoughts in the same way. If you are your thoughts, then what happens when the thought finishes? That's one of the deepest insights that you can have in meditation. What is that when there is no thought? There's nothing. I am a name. I call myself Sujato. But what happens when there's no names? There's no naming. There's no language. And because there's no language, there's nothing to go into the past and the future. Only the present is left. But that kind of present is a very different kind of present than the present I was talking about a little while ago when I was talking about the, the physical present. Yeah? Even, even uh, uh, animals can experience that, right? I mean, animals live, you know, dogs and cats and so on live pretty much in the present, don't they? Yeah? 
They don't plan for tomorrow. Yeah? You give them some food, they don't think, oh, I'll have half now and leave half for tomorrow. <laughs> They're in the present. But that's a very limited sense of present. That's a sense of present which is not, doesn't, is not capable of knowing the past and the future. But the present that I'm talking about now is a far more profound experience. Yes, of course, you know that, there, that I, I, you can think about the past and the future. You have that ability if you want to. But the mind, because of its contentment and because of its stillness, is profoundly settled in the present. So that the past and the future just disappear. So the more primitive form is that the past and the future are there, but you just don't know how to get there. You don't know what to do with it. And then when you develop your mind to, to learn how to think properly, then the past and the future are there, and you do know what to do with it. You can think about them and reflect on them. And this state that I'm talking about now, the past and the future are just not there anymore. They vanish. And the present is all that's left. So that present is very far from being a small thing. That's the present the Buddha described as vipulam, as vast, exalted, grown great. That's the present which is everything. It's the very smallest thing and yet it's the very biggest. And when we can experience that present, that deep sense of presence, when we, then we can let go very deeply of that sense of self and that sense of attachment to our thoughts, to our uh, identity, to who we are. Because none of that exists anymore. It's only the present. So once you've had that kind of experience, and it's a kind of experience that everyone can have at least to some degree. The deeper you meditate, the more deeply you'll, you'll see it, the more deeply you'll understand it. And when, when you've had that, then that is always there. That's always something that you can come back to. It's just the outcome of letting go. Let go of the past, let go of the future. That's what's there, is that present. So it's probably enough for this evening as I talk on the present, past and future and camels. And I'd like to invite if anyone has any comments or questions.